So, have you had a go at 3D TV yet? And what did you think? A major step forward in television history or a seaside novelty? Well, tonight is your last chance to decide because in a moment, Bob Symes will be entering the third dimension. Very scary. And then we'll reveal how it's done. What else? Ah, Hubble. The space telescope is due for its 600 million mile service. This is the big one for NASA. After recent cock-ups, they really need to get this one right. What else? Ah, oh, yes, fish. Something strange is happening with salmon. They're being bred to tell you where they're born. Let's get straight on with it. Put on your glasses, take a couple of aspirin. It's 3D time. Kate. Well, we've reported on many 3D techniques in the past, and so naturally, we're going to have a go at this one, especially as five million of you have already got the glasses. By the way, banks and building societies are still accepting donations for children in need. In a few minutes, we'll demonstrate the secret of how it works. First, here's Bob Symes. And if you don't have the glasses, don't worry, because with this system, you still get a perfectly good 2D picture. <laughs> When cycling, you always got to be in the right gear. And I don't mean the clobber I'm wearing, but bicycles are sprouting new gears every year. And this one is automatic. It relies on the centrifugal effect to shift the gears. As the wheel spins faster, three weights fly out, pushing the plate, which forces the derailleur to change into a higher gear. To make sure it works shifting down the gears, the freewheel is not on the rear gear block, but on the pedals, which means that the chain is always in motion. So, spring action on the weights automatically shifts the derailleur back down into low gear as I slow down. Marvelously ingenious. Mind you, the bike's got a mind of its own. The expert cyclist won't really like it, but for me, a weekend cyclist, it's great. Our bodies naturally have two gears, running and walking, and the distinction is taken very seriously by Britain's race walkers. Technically, to be walking and not running, one foot must always be in contact with the ground. Judging this by eye has always proved unreliable. Now, there's a pair of shoes that could help. Each shoe monitors contact with the ground with sensors in the heel and toe. The two shoes send messages to each other via minute electrical impulses through the body. So, if one toe leaves the ground before the other heel lands, the shoes emit a cautionary bleep. Persistent foul snaps, and the red light comes on, alerting the judges. These tents contain 10 meters of coiled spring steel. When thrown into the air, the steel tries to become straight, erecting the tent on the way down. There's quite a knack in stirring these away. A few twists, and with a spot of luck, the spring steel folds in a, on itself. There we are. There you are, nice and neat. Mind you, I would not like to ride out a storm in one of these. <laughs> I feel a bit dizzy after that, but you can have a rest from your glasses for a moment. The 3D effect isn't difficult to see, although, to be honest, there are going to be a few people who'll never see it at all. 
It's not actually a new idea for 3D. It's been used for television before, but never so ambitiously as in this past week. So, how does it work? The 3D we see in normal life relies on our brains processing two separate images from two slightly different viewpoints. Most 3D systems reproduce different views for each eye and various ways have been invented for getting two moving images to our eyes. The two colour system is probably the best known, but as with all these systems, if you're not wearing the glasses, the picture you see is much worse than usual, useless for broadcasting. But the 3D shown on the Beeb this week looks normal to people not wearing the glasses. That's because the effect doesn't rely on transmitting two separate images, but on a peculiarity of the way we see things. It's called the Pulfrick effect. What it is, is that the eye and the brain actually take longer to process a dark image than a brighter one. That's why you've got a dark filter on one side of the glasses. That means that the brain gets information from the right eye a fraction of a second later than the left. Now, that delay can produce a 3D effect when something's moving on your TV. Here's what happens. Say an object, in this case Carmen, moves across the screen from left to right. Now freeze a particular instant. What you see through the left eye with the light filter is Carmen here. But through the right eye with the dark filter, you see Carmen back here, where she was a 50th of a second ago. The brain, always keen to make sense of what signals the eyes are sending it, fuses the two separate images together and places the object where the two lines cross, here, apparently closer to the viewer. With an object moving the other way, it's reversed. Through the left eye, it's here. Through the right eye, here. And now the lines cross further away. So there's nothing special about the technology at our end, a perfectly normal TV camera pointing at this carousel. Try looking at it through the glasses. The things in the foreground are moving right, and the ones in the background moving to the left. Well, it's a treat. Now, let's prove the point. Change the direction of the carousel, and the effect disappears. But now, try turning your glasses the other way around, and you should see it again. Got it? Well, it can happen with all sorts of moving objects. Bits of football match or the 315 at Aintree may end up in 3D. All this explains why the 3D pieces you've seen this week have never stopped moving. The technique requires a bit of careful planning, not to say choreography, but probably the biggest challenge is 3D drama. We followed the BBC team making the new episode of Doctor Who, shown last weekend. It brought back some familiar faces, but it also brought together a lot of technicians, designers and camera experts to make it work. When was the last time you had that junk keeping for an MOT professor? Don't, don't be cynical, eh? It's just, the instruments are just a little erratic, that's all. Great, well, the trick of the whole thing was to stage the movement to create the best 3D effect. A real challenge for the director, Stuart MacDonald. It takes perhaps a bit longer than it would simply shooting a, a regular drama. One of those reasons is that the shots, by definition, have got to be on the move most of the time. And if the camera isn't moving, the people certainly have to be. And so you've got to get three or four people to move in particular directions when they're doing their right line and so on. And the scenery plays an important part too. OK, so we can slowly build up the foregrounds. Yeah, okay. For objects in the foreground to stand out, the camera must track past them so they cross the picture from left to right. We are running up to the pause. Oi! Is anybody there? Good. Now, what about the other foreground? I, I think it looks like a classic serial. It's the barrel work. Mm -hmm. We're going to reduce the barrel work. They place things in front of you, whereas before, normally, that's all clear so you can be seen. But they give depth of field. All oh, right, so the props are there, sort of prominently in front. So you yes, start, they're upstaging you. Oh. Get away, prop. <laughs> Maybe actors don't like that. It has to be very much an action adventure rather than a, a close dialogue situation, because obviously the minute you get into close-ups, uh, there is no real 3D element unless you move the camera. And by moving the camera, quite often you'll move from one side of the face to the other, which gives you enormous grammar problems in terms of cutting the shots together. What's very important, of course, is that every shot doesn't look the same. If you're not, if you're not careful, you, you, you always have a bit of 
railings in the foreground moving in one direction or you always have a car always moving in that direction and so on. So um, we're aware of the movements but the real trick is how to vary them within the context of, of the drum piece. So is there a future for this kind of technique? I think its application in drama per se is a little limited in that it has to be something that's really specially written for it in order to make it work. I think that a, a 30 minute drama or or even a 25-minute drama, all in 3D, might get a little wearing. So how have you found wearing the glasses? <laughs> well, I've enjoyed them no end. These are the, the executive model, um, the producer's perks, as they're called, which have uh, that capability on them. I must say, I put these on. You look three-dimensional both ways. But that's because you are. <laughs> and that's the point. Competing with a sense of depth we get in real life is no easy job. 